Hello, everyone. This is INFORM's 2021 tutorial on evolutionary computation. I'm Kalyan Moy Deb. I'm a university distinguished professor and a Carnegie Endowed Chair Professor at the Department of Electric and Computer Engineering at Michigan State. Here's my email address, and here's my personal website and my laboratory called Computational Optimization and Innovation, or in short, COIN, laboratory address over here. So what we're going to talk about today is how this evolutionary compute computation method works and how is it becoming an emerging field in search and optimization problems. I'll particularly talk about single criteria and multi-criteria optimization and decision-making. So I'll start with a scope of the optimization in practice. What are different problems where search and optimization come from, uh, from practice? Then what are some evolutionary optimization methods? Sometimes we call it as evolutionary computation, in short EC. And then for solving practical problems, particularly large scale or any other complexity, one needs to customize different search and optimization algorithm. So how do we customize an evolutionary algorithm? Then we'll talk about multi-criterion optimization when there are multiple criteria for search and optimization, how evolutionary methods can be useful in solving these kinds of problems. So multi-criteria optimization always comes with a multi-criteria decision-making task, so which we'll also talk about, and how evolutionary methods can help solve both of these problems. Optimization and decision-making would be of interest to us as well. And then as a byproduct with multi-objective or multi-criteria optimization, we can discover knowledge for a problem, and that's becoming a real interesting task for many multi-criteria optimization methods. So I'm going to introduce you to those with some examples. And then I'll briefly mention the current research trend in this field, and I'll conclude. All right, so let's begin with what are the problems in practice where search and optimization comes from? I think to this audience, I don't have to repeat this, but let me just go ahead and highlight a few of the things that I have been particularly using these methods for solving problems. First and foremost is, of course, the design and manufacturing. So uh, there are many products or manufacturing processes which needs to be optimized in order to get a, a very good or a reasonable solution at the end. For example, here you see a cab design or a cab of a car. So you see there are lots of parameters here, like, for example, the angle here, the thickness, the material, the, the geometries of different kinds. So they all become variables that the optimization vary. And then there will be one or more objective function. It could be if you're doing a lightweight design, it could be the weight of the cab, or if you're doing some safety considerations, so that could be a second criteria or some of these can go as constraints. So the goal of an optimization problem solving task would be first describe the problem and then employ an algorithm to find a solution. Then the other kinds of problems are going to be modeling tasks where you have a complicated system where we don't understand exactly what goes on, but there are certain inputs that goes into the system and some output that comes out. So we want to come up with a good model that how the output is related to the input. Then other kinds of problems are scientific experiments where they could be expensive to do or time consuming to do. So you can only do a few. So once you have done, let's say 10 such experiments, when you do another two or three more, can we optimize where to do those? So these are otherwise known as design of experiments. So to come up with design of experiments set up, uh, you can employ an optimization method to find a solution for it. Supply chain is the other one where the different parts comes from different sources. So, and there are different time requirements, volume requirements, and there are some interactions between them. So in order to get the overall product coming out at the end, how these things should be coordinated considering the uncertainties and everything involved in the system. Placement of objects becomes a combinatorial optimization problem in order to minimize the overall surface area, for example, a printed circuit board here, the area of that, how do we place different interconnected objects? And there could be, again, multiple criteria. The space minimization could be one thing. And then heat generations, because the ones that are connected uh, should be placed together in order to have a wear length minimum, but then that will create some hot spots. So always there are conflicting criteria that come in when you're trying to do any kind of design like that. 
The other kinds of problem where optimization and search are used quite, quite a lot is called the control problems. Here, these problems are a bit more difficult than the design problems, because here you deal with time dependent or some space dependent parameters. So your variables there are not just one quantity, but then it's a time varying function. So it gets a little difficult. Uh, prediction is another kind where you know search up to certain point in time, all the values, the performance of the system, you need to model this and then try to predict it in the future. And then the data mining and data analytics, the data comes from various sources, classification, clustering, regression. These are various different object detection, identification. All these becomes the machine learning or data analytics kind of work. Here, there could be, again, multiple objectives or a single criteria for coming up with a good solution. I think any intelligent systems can be designed using an appropriate objectives and constraints when you put in for which the optimal solution will behave in an intelligent manner. So in designing such intelligent systems, oftentimes search and optimization use, is used as a vehicle to come up with the final solutions. So you can see that there are various different problems uh, that come from practice where uh, a very efficient search and optimization method would be extremely useful. Over a few years now, there is this hierarchical optimization or multi-level optimization starting with bi-level. Optimization is becoming very, very important. It's simply because our society and our system works in a hierarchical way. So upper level decision makers come up with broader policies like taxes and other policies and rules. And then the lower level decision makers have to take those into account as if they're given and then decide on what kind of prop or what kind of uh, how frequently to do those uh, has to be decided given some of these policies. So a bit more difficult than the ones I showed you in the previous slide, but now there are methodologies, very efficient methodologies that are. So before we, I talk about these different methods, first I want to say that there are point-based methods and there are population-based methods. But whatever method you are using, I just want to say right up front is there is no provable optimization algorithm that exists for solving an arbitrary problem. Before we go into details of any algorithm, let us look at these two classes of optimization methods, one that are called point-based, other is the population-based. So let me just uh, talk about these two in a bit more detail. So point-based methods usually start with one point, let's say it's, it's a vector. It could be an existing solution that you have. Then the algorithm has a transition rule, which actually uh, changes the X into a new solution Y by applying the transition. This can use derivatives of the objective functional constraints or even some heuristics, for example. But you create Y from X. And it, usually it could be Y in the vicinity of X. Then compare Y with X, you evaluate Y, and you've already evaluated X before, so you can compare how good Y is with respect to X. If, X is, if Y is better, you keep it. You exchange X with Y. Otherwise, you keep your X and forget about Y, and then create, go into the loop and create another Y, and this will go on until a termination criteria is satisfied. Termination criteria could be the overall time of solving the problem, or it could be overall function evaluations, number of function evaluations, or you achieved some target solutions that you have been looking for. So these kinds of algorithms, it's what with these optimization literature started. Uh, they don't need much memory because just at any point of time, you have two solutions to save in your computer. Usually they have a local search property because the way you create Y from X usually uses a local search concept. You just find one in the local vicinity of X. There are not much parallel processing you could do, even though you can have multiple computers at your disposal. Relatively easy to do theory because you're just tracking one solution, how it's moving to the other. But once the problem, the transition rule is given, uh, there's not much room for you to change it or flexible unless you go and change the T completely. So this is how this works. So these algorithms have this local property. If you start from here in a problem trying to maximize, with iterations, it will move and give you a solution. If you start from another place, it may give you another one. If particularly the, the function landscape, the objective function that you're looking at as multiple local and global minimum or maximum. The other kinds of methods that are getting popular, and it's the main crux of my tutorial today, is the population-based optimization methods. Instead of having one point, now we have a population point, let's say Px. And then there's still a transition rule, which will take Px 
and convert into a new population Q. Now, there could be some overlapping solutions between P and X. Some solutions can be common, but you get that here. And, and this Q is now compared with P. And then the best half of that, if Q is of the same size of P, then the best half of the P and Q combined population is now called the new population P. And then you continue this process until a termination criteria is met. So the first look at it might say, oh, this could be expensive because instead of one point at every iteration, we are, we are evaluating more than one point. But it depends on not what you're doing at every iteration, but how many iterations do you need? So if there are very less number of iterations you need to get to the same termination criteria compared to the point-based methods, then this could be a computationally uh, uh, convenient or, or fast method. Now, of course, this one requires more memory. So memories these days are cheap. So that's, but just to say that this requires more memory, but they have now more global perspective because you are dealing with the population, it's very difficult to get stuck. For example, I can start with maybe this as my initial population. And then after one iteration, I may get some overlapping one and I get a new population like this. And then maybe new population like this. So this is how your population is moving. Now imagine that one of the solution is looking at a local optima here, which is already got, but as soon as you have something better than that in another local basin, then the algorithm will consider the previous solution that was good is not as good now. So the focus will now move to that one. So because you're dealing with the population, there is a better global perspective this algorithms have. You could do a lot of parallel processing with these kinds of algorithms because a population is getting charmed compared with this solution to the other solutions. So it all depends on what is the transition rule that you do. It's not very easy to do theory. That's because there are many solutions to crack and it's not so an easy task, but they're very flexible because now you can compare two solutions within a population, three solutions within a population and say, in comparison, this is better than that. There we could do X and Y, but here you have multiple solutions to compare. So you can get a consensus of where you are going with these populations. But no matter what method you do here, Wolpert and Meckerdy in 1997 came up with this theorem they call no free lunch theorem. In short, we call it NFL. So what does this theorem say? If you have two algorithms, A1 and A2, any two algorithms, A1 could be something that you have just developed, very sophisticated, but A2 could be something you've taken from the literature. If you're interested in now solving all possible problems, let's, let's put them into this huge class called F. And now I'm going to apply A1 to each member of F and I get a performance measure, how well A1 did on F. And I do an aggregate measure on all these functions, how A1 did, let's call that P1. And the same thing I do for A2, now applying all of them, applied on the same computer, same termination criteria and all that. And I get P2 as an aggregate, they have proven P1 is equal to P2. So what this basically means is, if you are interested in developing an algorithm for solving any possible optimization problem that I ever face, no one algorithm is better than another algorithm. So that's what it means. It's not very negative, it just says that if you are interested now in a narrow class of problem, let's say one particular type of problem, let's say cab design or a gearbox design, just one, then you can find an algorithm A1, which, is, which could be better than any other method. So NFL breaks down if you're interested in a narrow class, but if you say, no, here's my algorithm, which is most efficient in all problems that you can ever come across, this theorem says it's not possible. Okay, so with this kind of background, point-based methods, as I said, are fast, local, theory-based. They're successful in deterministic problems over the years, hard to modify, and then suit a particular problem. On the whether the population-based methods are relatively slow, but I put it on a quote to say that sometimes we found population methods are even faster. That's because we need less number of iterations and these parallel processing helps help us jump over the search space. I will show you one some such example later. They are global in nature, they're parallel, they're flexible, and they're great potential for complex problems. They're easy to customize. So with these kinds of differentiation of the two methods, I think you cannot ignore any one of these methods. Point-based methods are more popular 
and are more prevalent in the literature, population-based methods are getting to be popular. And this is one of the main crux of my talk today, but evolutionary optimization is one such population-based methods, which I'll introduce to you soon. So that means if you want to solve a narrow class of problem, which is complex, but this is what you do day in and day out, it's better to come up with a customized algorithm for that problem class, not for a particular problem instance, but for a problem class. So this beats the NFL theorem and for routine and consistent applications, I think this is the way to go. But to apply now a customization to an algorithm, your algorithm has to be customizable. So that's another thing. And this is what I've been saying here is that uh, the point-based methods, it's all given how you will transit from one point to another and off or they are not amenable to be customized the way you want it, them to be. But the population-based methods can be very flexible for you to customize. So what is an evolutionary algorithm which falls under these population-based optimization methods? So you start first with a solution representation. And then you have an iteration counter to be fancy, we call generation to be zero. You initialize a population. Let's say in some space, I've got these seven solutions that I've initialized evaluate them to know their function value and constraints. If you're not terminating, then modify this population into a new population. So this initial population is often known as the parent population. And then you first pick the good solutions of the population by this operator called selection. So this is where the Darwin survival the fittest idea comes in. Let's say these are the four solutions that are, that are better compared to this uh, PT population here. Now use these four solutions to create a new population, which is often called as an offspring population. This could be these open circles that are created from this. How do you create? There could be several ways. One is called the recombination, where I take the description of these two problems and I can take one part of one and the other part of the other by recombining two of the solutions and I get two new solutions known as offspring solutions. And occasionally we can mutate some of the variables here I'm showing them on binary strings. Later I will show you how to do it on real parameter, but you can do some processing on them because they are good. So when you create offspring solutions from them by using their features and properties, most likely you are going to create good solutions, but sometimes you don't, but you don't, you don't care, you just create them. After you create it, then you evaluate. So now you know their function and objective value. Then you combine the offspring populations, all these open circles with the original parent population or the current parent population, PT and PWST, and apply a survivor operator. Who should survive? So in this case, it could be these two parents have survived and these five offspring have survived. So you try to keep the population size same as what you started with at every generation. Then you increment the counter and go into the loop. So it's a very simple algorithm. You can come here and everywhere you see these red words here, uh, this is where you can, they're flexible, you can change them to the way you want, you can even do selection, variation, survivor, or a problem-specific operator. That's how you customize your algorithm for the problem class that you're trying to solve. Okay, there are, this is called the genetic algorithm framework, but there are other methods called particle swarm optimization, which I'm not going to talk today, differential evolution, covariance metric adaptation based evolution strategy. There are many, many other, about 100 different meta heuristics that are available that kind of uses very similar concept with the population. To most of these problems for this, pro this algorithm class, Rudolph in 95 came up with an asymptotic convergence proof. That means if you have a mutation operator that can take you from any point to any point in the search space, and if you have an elite preservation, which is done here, that the previous and the current population is combined and the better populations are kept, um, he showed that these algorithms eventually asymptotically approaches the global minimum. So we have that back up uh, as a proof. A generic proof, what it doesn't tell us is when we're going to get there, but that's what the properties of asymptotic proofs are. So these kinds of algorithms have a niche with, um, with different kinds of problems, but you can change the whole algorithm, the whole sequence of how you're doing. You can introduce a new operation as well. Uh, because their population approach, there's a better chance of finding global optima that I mentioned before, potential to find and store multiple solutions, particularly if you want to capture multiple parito solutions in a multi-objective scenario, you can do that. And they have this implicit parallelism, which really helps them find um, good search spaces quickly. 
and there are direct approaches. Nowhere we mentioned gradient yet. So, but if you have gradient information, you can club it. And one example I'm going to show you for that. You can also handle different kinds of procedural, objective, and constraint function variables. So they're very flexible to be used. Um, there are other niches that they have. For example, if you want to develop concepts of solving a problem, not just solve the problem. Like if you have a high risk building, you know that the, the basement here or the first floor here will have the highest dimension. And as you go up, uh, the dimensions can be equal or less. So when you have such knowledge, you can actually come up with a concept of how to build a high risk building. And we've done that in robotics problems to avoid obstacles instead of designing a robot path planning for a specific set of scenarios with how the objects are moving, we come up with the generic brain of a robot. So this kind of concept development are very, very useful for these, uh, these types of algorithms. And parallel implementation is ex extremely efficient in solving such problems. Now, I'm not just talking about this, but they have been actually implemented in practice. Uh, recently in 2017, Mitsubishi Regional Jet emerged has come out where many things in this aircraft was designed, many aspects of that has been designed using an evolutionary algorithm. Nose of the bullet train that you see here was designed based on genetic algorithms simply because they tried with the point-based method in 2006, but uh, it failed to, to pass the wind tunnel test. So then they heard of genetic algorithms and they used that and came up with the method, came up with a solution, the solution class that would pass the wind tunnel test. So it, now if you go to Japan and take the bullet train, just have a look at the look at the nose if you can and know that this was designed using an evolutionary algorithm. Their subsequent series since 2007 is now being designed using the genetic algorithm. Pony's elevators, uh, many people are pushing a button at various floors and some control system has to decide which car will go to which floor so that people inside the car and outside the car are not waiting too long. Uh, too much. So when I take the take their user's manual and you see this, the allocating landing calls is designed using genetic algorithm. I know they have been doing this since 1995. So the customization I've mentioned, and I've also mentioned about some problems, variables can have monotonic reduction or, or increase the other way. There's an easy way to handle these things. For example, I can keep X1 as X1 and instead of X2, I can redesign, I can call it another variable called P2, which is the ratio between X2 and X1. And I ensure that P2 doesn't exceed one. That's my upper level. So because P2 cannot exceed one, so X2 cannot be more than X1. So that's how I actually satisfy this condition, every solution I create over here. So that's a change right in the representation, which takes care of many of your constraints. So these are some customizations that are applicable to specific problems. Here is one, uh, cantilever beam design problem, or if you put this horizontally, what you have is this high raised buildings is what I was talking about, the dimensions reduce as you go towards the T. Uh, there are other kinds of problem, particularly in business, when you want to spend your money to several stocks, let's say M stocks, uh, if these are the proportion of stock of your money you spend on stock one, proportion of your money you, you spend on stock two, and so on and so forth, their sum has to be one. So there's a very simple way you can satisfy this equality constraint. You can create a number x1, x2, or all of these between 0 and 1. But then after creating that, immediately repair them x1 equal to x1 divided by their sum. So if you replace all of them like this, then their sum now will always be equal to 1. So this is a sure way you're ensuring every time you come up with a solution before you send it for evaluation, you have satisfied the key constraint. And that makes a huge difference in the performance of an algorithm. There are many such customizations that we often do in problems. And every time showing that, they produce a lot of advantage. And these kinds of algorithms allow you to do that. Here's another one for a combinatorial optimization problem for placement. We came up with a random key concept or another permutation as a fixed coding concept that ensures that whatever you come up with here is always going to lead to a valid uh, for example, a TSP or a valid combinatorial solution. You can also do customization in the initialization. Oftentimes you have one or two solutions that are usually the past solutions or you currently know. So if these are the two solutions in your search space you have, what you can do is to create your population, initial population, you can recombine and mutate them. Like 
to create some of these blue solutions. And now you can start from here. Because these two are good, chances are that what you're creating from them to start your initial population will have certain diversity, but they're also not far away from it. So with a, with, with a slightly changed objective function or constraints, uh, you will be in a better position to come up with or very quickly come up with now optimal solutions with respect to these problems that you had before. When you have real parameters, instead of doing you know, a, a single point kind of crossover, which we do in, in our binary variables or binary strings representing Boolean variables, uh, you can actually use a probability distribution between two parents and giving importance of solutions that are close to the parents with high probability but their distribution depends on the difference between the two parents. So this is what we call as simulated binary crossover, which can be applied to real parameter optimization. Uh, you could also do similar mutations, like if this is your point, you can use a simple Gaussian mutation with a particular sigma that you can define based on which stage of your optimization you are in to create a point in the neighborhood. There are other more sophisticated ways of handling constraints that have been proposed, but this is what we have been doing over the last 30 years or so, where these ideas were first applied to any kind of real world problems is trying to come up with customization because uh, they really help to provide some kind of problem information into developing these algorithms. So I'm going to show you one example, which I personally did for an industry where their goal was when, this, when they heat up certain amount of metal, they pour it at, to make different castings. And there could be n different castings, each one having different weights. And you may have to do some five copies of that, 10 copies of that, and so on and so forth. So all these are known to you. And with one heat, you will not be able to make all of them. So you need to come back and do, and usually there are three to four hours time gap between them. So this company's goal was that they wanted to do it for a month, month long assignment today. And that involves about 50 to 100,000 variables. The good part is when we, when we evaluate and kind of formulate the problem, it turns out that this is a linear program because if xij is your variable that says how many copies of the j casting you want to make from the ith heat, this cannot be a non-integer because it's the number of copies you are making. You cannot make 2.5 copies from a heat. That means two full copies and one half and three hours later you come and, and fill the rest. You cannot do that in casting. And then there are constraints that says for every heat, the amount of weight that you, are, that you are utilizing should not be more than the vessel weight, the vessel capacity. Uh, and then there are other kinds of constraints that says when you sum up for every casting, all the copies you've made, that should be exactly equal to the amount. So this problem description comes in from various different other problems. I think in the oral literature, this is known as a cutting stock problem. And there are many different algorithms that has been proposed over here. But as an optimization problem, uh, it's a linear program, but integer variable, so we call it integer linear program. So the way to solve this problem using point-based methods is to go with this branch and bound and branch and cut methods where you treat the variables to be real, and then based on whether you've got an integer solution or not, you branch it to one of the variables and then keep doing. There are some ways you fathom, and once you fathom everything and there's nowhere to branch anymore, then you see what is the best solution. Now, this algorithm is, is an exponential algorithm. It's not going to give you a solution very, very quickly, particularly if the number of variables are huge, where we're talking about here 50,000 or so variables. So I'm going to show you some results on this particular casting scheduling problem using IBM Simplex and Octave's GLPK. These are the two methods we've used here. So let's say I take a very small size problem with 650 kilo vessel. Requiring, so there are 10 objects, 10 castings, uh, each requiring 20 copies, uh, will involve over 20,000 kilos of metal. So if we say that we are looking for 99.7% metal utilization and we'll be fine, this requires about 31 hits. So 31 times 20 makes up 310 variables. This is far less compared to 50,000 variables the company needs. To that problem, the GLPK cannot find, cannot find the solution even for that small problem. But simplex, it was a piece of cake, 0 0.05 seconds. Uh, many times we run without any kind of, every time it takes a similar amount of time, but importantly, it finds the optimal solution. And then when you move to thousand variables by increasing the numbers here, uh, it still solves it. 
99.462% retail utilization within 0.13 seconds. But when you go to 2000 variable, it cannot solve it anymore. And then for 1800 variable, we could solve it, but anything more than that, it cannot. So here I'm showing you what happens on a 2000 variable problem. After about 30 minutes of running CPLEX, uh, it told, it, it's telling us that about 35 million such nodes were opened by that time. And of them only about 35,000 or slightly less than that, this red line, um, that many nodes are still uh, left to be fathomed. So I thought maybe another few minutes are needed. Then I ran 15 hours on that. Both these lines have been, been growing and they were, there was no sign of coming down. So that means up to 1800, the CIPLEX was able to solve it. Anything more than that, the dimensions was too much for the algorithm to solve the problem. But we needed to solve 50,000. So we came up with an algorithm that is based on this evolutionary concept. We have an initialization where we try to utilize the equality constraints. We make sure every initial population satisfies every equality conditions. And then we come up with a recombination operator that takes some from one parent and some from the second parent and combines to a new offspring. Let's explain how we do this. It's a small problem, only four heats I'm showing you here, parent one from the population, parent two from the population. We go heat by heat. So first heat of the first parent compared with first heat of the second parent. And we see that first one requires 343 um, metal, a kg metal, and the second one 625. So this is closer to 650 kilo. So it's better utilization. So I, this is a better combination than that. I take this and put into my channel. Then I go the second with second here. 808, 667, both of them are infeasible because I melted 650, I cannot use 667, I cannot use 808. But that's the solution as I'm starting with. It's an infeasible solution, but this is still better, right? This is closer to 650 than that. So I take a copy of that and put into my channel. And then third, 629 versus 606, 629 is better. So I take that and put into my channel. So like that, I built my child all my equality constraint was satisfied by the parents because I make sure it can it, it is done. Now I see that some of them got violated. This is supposed to be two. And the fact that I take some from here and some from there, it's making that. And then also I'm not able to completely make this uh, feasible. Mm -hmm. So we try to use two operators, which we call mutation. <clears throat> mutation one, try to fix this equality constraint. So it's easy because there are three ones I have to reduce one so I need to decide which one I want to drop from here. And I look at these values, which one get um, violated here, and I try to take that one out. Now, that is, I have an algorithm that guarantees this process in one iteration, taking on the order n squared times h computational effort. Mutation two tries to satisfy the inequality constraints. And again, it tries to do this way that if I have, if this is more than 650, like four kilos more, I have to actually take one of these one or one of the one from the two here to make it to somewhere else. So I then look at which one is the smallest, like 558, and I could actually take this one over there. That way I can save here and I may not still exceed 650. So this operation I do once, and if it makes my solution feasible, it's good. If it does not, because sometimes it cannot, in that case, I apply a penalty corresponding to the constant violation. I go ahead with my algorithm. So I don't try to satisfy all my inequality constraints here. That little help that, that when it is able to do it is enough for the optimization algorithm to work with. So you can see the performance. On 310, I get the same result as CIPLEX did, but it's slightly lower time. Similarly, the 1,000 variable, same, same performance with, with lower time. Now 2,000 variable I can solve in 0.19 seconds with, with the with the, with the optimal efficiency, yeah? because in these problems, I know where the optimum is, but I simply don't know how to get it, but I know the optimal metal utilization. It can be somewhere very close to 100%. Now I move to a 1 million version of the problem to, to do some parametric study. Here I show that population size, if you take very small, like eight or 12 or 16 or 20, it doesn't work because our goal is to get a solution which is 99.7%. Somewhere around 30, it starts to work. But then after that, no matter what population size you use, you just take more and more computation, but it works. So based on this, we don't want to be just at the blink of, at the brim of working or not working. We try to be somewhere here. 
So let's say about 40 to 60 would be the good population size. So this is a typical performance of an evolutionary algorithm. Very small population size doesn't have enough diversity for the solution to go to the desired solution. Very large population size, you have lots of solutions to go there, but it's unnecessarily more expensive. So you need to find this sweet spot for a problem. And that's where you need to do this parametric study to come up with what population size is great for your algorithm to solve that particular problem. Here I show you for a particular run how the function evaluations, the, oh, sorry, the objective function value approaches 99.7%. And you can see this is a semi-log plot. This is in log scale, the y-axis and x-axis is the iteration counter in normal scale. We get almost a linear performance means it's x, this fitness value or this objective function is exponentially reducing and getting towards the minima. So this algorithm is jumping in the search space by reducing the function value exponentially in order to get to only with few iterations you can get there. Now here's the big picture. Now I use this algorithm many times to solve a particular size problem, 50,000 to all the way to 1 billion. In my uh, knowledge, there are not many algorithms, optimization algorithms that have been used to solve a practically motivated problem with such a large scale uh, level. So uh, you can see that I have a log log plot here. The y-axis shows the actual clock time, computational time needed by the algorithm on the computer that is mentioned there. And they're all linear here. So log log means it's a polynomial plot with an order of 1.1, slightly worse than linear, much better than quadratic, to a huge range of problems that you're solving. Now, you can see probably two lines there, which is the best performance out of 10 runs and the worst performance. You can't even see in some of them. So this is to say that each of these points, when we plot here, we got 99, at least 99.7% utilization. We are not claiming any of them being optimum. So for some of these problems, optimum may be somewhere from 99.7 to 100%, which is like about two kilo uh, worse than your optimum. So for all practical purposes, these are acceptable, but now I give you a polynomial time algorithm to a problem which is NP hard. This, if you recall, this cutting stock problem is an NP hard problem. So to show that it's an NP hard, what we do next is we increase our accuracy requirement. So I showed you results with 99.7, but I can now say 99.9 .9 or 99 and so on and so forth. Now you can see in the semi-log plot, my computational time requirements is already exponential. If you want to go close and close to the optima, so in the actual space, it's actually a super exponential algorithm. So the, the, what it says is the problem is still NP hard, but if you put it your limit saying, this is acceptable to me, then I can give you a polynomial time algorithm with the increasing number of variables. So this kind of results you can achieve with the population-based concepts. You see that there was a minimum population requirement. I couldn't have gone to population size one, which would be a point-based method. We needed about 40 to 60 population members for us to do it. Okay, so that to show for a single criteria problem how evolutionary methods can be very useful, in particularly if you're interested in an approximate solution close to an optima, but you want to get this quickly. Now, we can also use this for multiple criteria problem where there are two or more objectives that you have to simultaneously optimize. That results into a Pareto optimal set because there doesn't exist a single solution that is best for both or more of these conflicting objectives. So our goal in these kinds of problem is to get a representative set of Pareto solutions first, and then pick one using the MCDM concept. There are lots of um, arguments that are made that if you have, there are multiple objectives that you have for each objective, your solution may look completely different, but you need to find the compromise solutions, come up with, uh, come up with one that is not excellent for any one of these criteria, but it's a good solutions for all the criteria. And in early 90s, we started working with developing evolutionary methods of solving it because we are dealing with the population, we thought we can capture multiple parameter solutions in a single run instead of doing a weighted sum or an epsilon constraint or achievement scalarizing function methods multiple times. So instead of doing a scalarizing methods multiple times, we just keep the problem as it is and then try to find a representative set of Pareto solution and capture and store them in my population. So I've written a book in 2001 talking about some of these methods. There are other books also in the literature. So we separate the optimization with decision-making. First, we optimize, find a set of Pareto solutions, 
and then we go into decision making and pick one from it. These days, some diagonal methods have started where we try to combine um, opt optimization with decision making during the optimization phase. So one of the very popular methods is actually the most cited paper in the whole evolutionary computing field with about 42,000 Google Scholar citation for a single IEEE transaction paper. We call it non-dominated sorting GA or NSGA2. Uh, it solves two and three objective problem very nicely, starts from random solutions and then or iterations, it comes and represents the Pareto surface with a, with a few points. This idea has been coded in various commercial softwares uh, and it's a lot of industries are starting to use this kind of concept. So again, you have a population and you have an offspring population you've created from the parent by using the standard operations. And then you combine them to a non-dominated sorting. That means identify the non-dominated solutions that goes as F1 and then find the next set of non-dominated solution F2 and so on and so forth. Then you start accepting F1 first because these are more, uh, these are much better than F2. F2 is much better than F3. A point will come when not all F3 you can take to keep the population size of the next generation same as the PT size. So now you need to choose few from here. Which one you choose, that's where you use some kind of diversity preserving mechanism and pick the ones as many we need. And the diversity preserving mechanism works like this. If there are five solutions in that third front and you only have to pick three, these are the three we'll pick. And there are some ways you compute the crowding distance around each point to find out that these are isolated points and these are two extremes. And, and that's what we then accept and remove these two. So just to show you how this works on a, on a simple sketch of a problem here, uh, if the parents are denoted with with squares and the circles are denoting the offspring. And there are, I think about six of them in each. So the total 12 points. First we do is non-dominated sorting. So if you're minimizing F1 and F2, A, E and five belong to the first front. So we accept them first because I have a six population slot. And then the others are coming like this. The second front, I already see there is one, two, three, and four solutions. And I have to choose three more. So I eliminate all the other here and go into this second front and do this crowding calculation and find out that three B and one should stay and D should be eliminated. So this becomes my new set of points. And then I continue with that and all these moves. So let me show you a simulation of how this works. And you can see starting from somewhere there, how with iterations, this NSGA2 can come from a two objective problem we are minimizing. And the blue line was the Pareto set. And you can see they come in a, in a frontwise manner eventually converts to the Pareto form. There's nothing below it, so it cannot go there. And, and recently we have uh, extended the NSGO2 concept for solving more than three objective problems or three uh, using what is known as NSGA3. So slight modification to that, but you can see now in a three objective problem, F1, F2, F3, how starting from some solutions here, how the solutions move to the Pareto set and eventually can give us a very good idea of the Pareto surface. Now this goes to the decision maker with, uh, with let's say about 50 to 60 different points found here. And then they can then see which place to concentrate and then pick one. We can even cluster if you want five solutions, we can cluster from it and give you five solutions. These ideas have been extended for constraints with a very simple idea that uh, tournament selection is one of the operator. When I said we implement the Darwin's concept, you are basically comparing two solutions, I and J. You choose I if I is feasible and J is not. You choose I if both I and J are invisible, but I has a smaller constraint violation. You choose I if both I and J are feasible and I dominates J. So these three conditions you apply to your comparison mechanism and that changes everything without any parameter. And now you have pressure coming from the invisible side to get towards the Pareto front and from the feasible side to get towards the Pareto front through this non-domination. So very quickly, things convert and the important part is there is no additional parameter needed. So this is only possible with the population based approach. And this is what I've been highlighting that they are very flexible to be changed. The constraint handling, we do it in a way without any penalty parameter. Pressure builds up among these populations from both invisible side and feasible side to go towards the Pareto region. Here is an example of how this idea works. Uh, this is the feasible region here. And you can see that we're minimizing the two objectives. So the Pareto front is somewhere here, but not all parts is Pareto optimal because this part gets dominated by this point. 
So this algorithm is trying hard. If you get a point here, it's invisible. If you get a point here, this can get dominated by another member. So if you keep running it, like you're already at 300 iteration, it's trying to readjust the point so that it gives you a very nice idea of how the benefit from this. But why do these evolutionary methods work? Well, I think I highlighted because there's a population approach, so we can find multiple solutions simultaneously. Um, we already have a way to maintain diversity, but the important thing is the parallelism. Like if you get one point out of your population close to the Pareto frontier, in the next few iterations by recombination, it can bring this solution down, okay? And that's the implicit parallelism that I've been talking to about. And here is an example. Uh, if you don't do any implicit, like if, for example, in NSGA2, this you see that generation 10, 11, then I skip the 12 and 13 and 15, you can see how they are moving towards the parity front. But if I take one of the solutions and do a local search and find a solution which is marked here as A and introduce that into the population, that means this is simulating the idea that this is a good solution close to the parity front. Look at what happens in the next few generations. These solutions have already moved quite a bit compared to if you don't do that. So that's kind of demonstrating what I was telling you that the implicit parallelism is one of the big reasons why finding multiple parameter solutions simultaneously is the way to go. Okay, this field has grown uh, in, in, uh, in many folds. These are the number of papers that have come and you can see some exponential growth with some stabilization and another growth have started and so on and so forth. Uh, they've been applied to various different areas in engineering, computer science, mathematics, and to even medicine and various different. Let's now move to how the decision-making can be done. So there are three ways we could do decision-making. A priori, where the decision-making is already done and a scalarized problem is already created. A posteriori, where we start with finding a Pareto set and then make the decision-making. This is what I have been telling you so far. And then the third one is interactive method. We do, do MCDM and EMO together. EMO is the evolutionary multi objective of humanization. And we've recently written a book where most of the chapters are written by a, a combination of an MCDM researcher along with an EMO researcher. Uh, recently in management science, we, we published a paper, which it's a survey paper to show that developed around early nineties, how EMO had uh, very quickly capturing uh, much of the work in this field on the, and decision making, but there are other techniques that are also coming in. Everything is improving, but Emo has taken a huge leap in, in kind of capturing the, the, the research and application that's going on in the field. So a priori or a posteriori can be applied if you know certain reference points, for example, beforehand, certain aspiration points in terms of objective combinations. So instead of finding the whole pair to front, you can then go and find points that are close to these aspiration points. You could do this in different kinds of techniques. Or they could do with the reference direction approach. You have a direction going from, let's say, Nadir point to ideal point or some other way, and you go in equal steps there, and you want to see if I project those points onto my Pareto set, how do they look? And then, so the direction is, is directed by your trade-off information, and then some algorithm tells you that if you move from top to bottom here, the solution here moves that way and you can then observe the properties of the solutions and then make a decision. There are other ideas like light beam search where you take a torch and light your Pareto surface with certain trade-off information and with the width. So this, instead of getting the whole Pareto set, you might get a few points there and a few points there of your preferred points. And then you can maybe pick one with more uh, subjective evaluations. So let me show you how we have utilized these MCDM concepts with the EMO. Let's say I have a problem here. This is a car side impact problem. We first find a, a, the user gives us that this is our reference direction, now the point to ideal point. We take equal steps in this, and for each of them, we project to the Pareto surface, and you can see the points we are getting. Instead of seeing the whole Pareto set, the decision maker will only see these points. And then decision maker says, I like this, but I'm going to change the direction next time from that point to this point. And then we again get equal points here. And then we get the projected points and the decision maker now says, this is the point I like. And then he says, now go this direction. We can find the points and he says, no, I'm still fine with that. So when two consecutive iterations are same, then you say, okay, there's no point moving further or 
if the decision maker gets happy, then you terminate. So this is one way, instead of discovering all the Pareto points first and then choosing what, we can actually have MCDM and EMO put together. Then there is this a posteriori approaches where after you found the EMO solutions, you can pick one based on some compromise programming approaches or trade-off approach where we look at for every point, if you look at their neighbors, how much you are sacrificing versus how much you're gaining. So that ratio can give you a good point to be chosen from that. Or there's a pseudo weight concept that I proposed in my book three years ago. So recently we implemented a progressively interactive concept with uh, some MCDM researchers here. And there are other people who have also uh, worked on some of those ideas like Branka et al in EMO 2009, another approach. The concept is, we will give pairwise solutions to the decision maker as we are running. Let's say at some intermediate iterations, we get the non-dominated solutions and we provide pairwise solutions to them and ask them to compare and say, do you like any one of them or not? So based on their information, we try to model their preference structure using some utility function. And there are certain properties that we will maintain for this utility function, basically find the coefficient by solving these problem. So let's say in this case, these four or five solutions that we have, user said, I like this solutions better than that, two better than three, three better than four, and four better than five. So you see, we came up with a utility function with the contour plot going, having less value this direction actually captures that. So that then once I capture it, I can then utilize it in my algorithm for next few iterations so that this preference structure is honored. So we change our definition of domination and, and which solution is better in our selection operator using this concept. So that has allowed us to solve different kinds of problems. Here is an example. Here's the entire Pareto set, but this is the ultimately what the user wanted, but they didn't know beforehand. But starting from here, you see a generation five, then 10, then 20, and like this, the best solution is converging this way and eventually getting there. So at the end, we don't give you the entire Pareto set, but just a solution here that the decision makers helped us get there. So decision making and optimization going on simultaneously. There are many other works that uh, Roman Slowenski and others have done recently on this is worth looking into. Because of the interest of time, I'm now going to just briefly go over some of the advances that you have done on this evolutionary multi-objective methods. First one I'm going to talk about is innovization. What it means is we can discover innovative solution principles to multi-objective optimization. Imagine I'm designing a motor and there are two objectives I have in mind. I want to maximize the rated power, which would make my motor huge, bigger and bigger. And simultaneously, I want to reduce the volume of the motor, the size of the motor. So that's going to get keep us the best one would be the other extreme. So these are the two extreme solutions. And if you do in a multi-objective way, you are going to generate some kind of solutions. Now I can find them using these EMO methods that we talked about. But now if you open the box and see the variables, what is the armature size? How many turns are we make? What is the dimension, diameter of the wear, insulation thickness? All these, if you look at, we might find some pattern as we go from this, this extreme to the other extreme. If we learn that pattern, maybe that will give us a lot of knowledge about how to solve this problem for a range of different scenarios that I'm interested in. So this done once, the designers or the practitioners can, can get a lot of ideas about how to solve the problem. So we did lots and lots of problems. I'm showing you one here as a gearbox design problem having 28 variables, 101 nonlinear constraints, three objectives, we find that there is a two-dimensional pair to front by our NSGA3 method. Now, if we go from one extreme to the other, by looking at how these gear thicknesses, the gear number of teeth and the module, there is one parameter called module, which is critical for the gear shape. How are they changing from this end to that end? We look at that except one, which is the module, rest all are more or less the same. So these are all the solutions and you see they're more or less horizontal. But this one is drastically changing and it's a nice monotonic way they're changing. It's a discrete variable. That's where you see the jumps here. But if I fit a curve through this, I notice that it is actually proportion to, and the module is proportion to square root of power. It's a square root law. So it gives me a rule. It gives me a thumb rule or a knowledge that 
If you want to really design this gearbox optimally, your module has to be in proportion to the power you require and square root of that. So, you know, these kinds of very useful information can come as a property of near parity solutions and that can stay with the company or the, or the research. The research in this field is going on in many different directions because many problems in practice are uh, very expensive. So we have to do surrogate assisted optimization. There are uncertainties in implementing the solutions. So we have done with uncertainty handling in multi-objective optimization. I mentioned about bi-level where there are two uh, problems, optimization problem, one nested inside. If these, each of these problems are multi-objective, each of them have their parito set, it gets an exponentially harder problem. But you come up with some ideas of how to handle those kinds of problems. Problems in practice have mixed integer, large scale nature. I showed you a large scale problem for single objective, but we have done very large scale problem with like an engine design, for example, of a motor, uh, of an automobile um, uh, with, uh, with about 150 design variables, about 150 constraints and six criteria. Uh, dynamic optimization where the problems are changing with time uh, and then optimization to help machine learning algorithms like neural architecture search, the generative adversarial network design of some of the latest ideas. We are using efficient optimization methods to solve those problems. Again, the customization is the key when we apply uh, uh, you know, the algorithms for a particular problem class. Then we call many objective optimization when your number of objectives are more than three because you needed slightly different kinds of algorithms like an SGA3, but we've shown we can also solve all the way up to 15 or 20 objectives so far. Um, Learning-based optimization where some of the machine learning ideas come and help optimization. So both ways, these two ideas can help each other. And then of course, very innovative applications that other methods have not done yet. I'm going to finish my talk with this last example which we recently did uh, with the New Zealand land, um, land area, which is owned by the local tribe called Maori. There are 14 different criteria. So they decide what to do in this, how to change one landscape into another. There are about 100 different options are there in about 300 different paddocks. This problem is also known as a wicked problem. And for this work, we received the Wiley Practice Prize from the International Society of Multi-Criteria Decision-Making. So objectives come from environment, objectives come from revenue or the money that you have to spend to make the land use change. And then the objectives come from productivity because these uh, people are, are producing a lot of things like solo dairy products and they sell and make their living. They are paying money to bank because they're taking loans. So how much they can reduce that and also there are environmental effects because the nitrogen, phosphorus that reach uh, fertilizers they are using for their farm, they are going into a nearby lake. So um, this problem has a huge search space. So 100 different options in each of the paddocks. You see here there are about 315 of them, makes it 100 to the power 315 different ways. But then in 10 years, they are making this change because one year they don't have enough money and time to implement all the land use changes that they want to do. So it gets to a huge number of solutions that you have to look at. And many societal problems have these kinds of astronomical search space. So we came up with a methodology, which is NSGA2 based, but it's more like a reference point based NSGA2. We are clubbing the objectives into three classes and to show you the parity of but actually the optimization when done with all 14 objectives. I will show you first these um, minimum, see the minimum environment solutions. It's the most environment friendly solution. And then I'm going to show you next is one maximum profit solution. And by the way, we have also implemented a virtual reality-based system so that these Pareto surfaces can be seen life-size using a goggle uh, because uh, we had heterogeneous decision makers here uh, and the Maoris, their seniors like this kind of visualization so they can go under and see the trade-offs between two solutions in front of them. Okay. So um, if I take this environmentally solution over 50 years, you can see each of these 14 objectives, how they are changing. But I can show you how the land use changes with time, starting with those blues here are dairies, lake is somewhere there. And this was the current implementation and all the phosphorus nitrogen was going to the lake. This was the initial one. I see in 10 years, you can see how the land use are changed. And eventually at the 11th year, they have the final solution 
that changes everything and comes to this stage. So no blue over here, but this information was not told. The algorithm has found such a solution because it found if it does that, it optimizes those 14 objectives nicely. Then I'll show you one solution now, not with the simulation, just the final one for the highly profitable solution. Uh, these are the 50 year variation of the 14 objectives, but here is the final one. Now to show them side by side, this is the highly profitable solution and this is the highly environment friendly solution. You can see there are differences, there are some common things. So the common things is what I known as the knowledge. So these people can learn that maybe the geographic situations of these places are such that no matter what solution you pick, what, what criteria you give more importance, is it the uh, environment or is it the profit or is it the productivity? Some of the things you always have to do the same way. And, and the forest departments can come up with such a rule based on this, which we have known as best management practices. But the Maoris also like this idea because they thought what we're doing is very, very transparent. But now comes the decision making because we have about 100 different solutions in between. So when we went to the Maoris, with which they like this highly profitable design, but we started them with this solution, which is environment friendly, which they hated. And then we went towards this. And they say, until a certain point, they said, okay, now we can, we can, we are okay with those solutions. Then we went to the government officials. And we started from the highly profitable solution, which they didn't like, and we went that way. And we found that until certain points, there are solutions that they like. So we found that there are four solutions that are common. And we tried to work with them and see if they can come up with one common solutions, but they could not. So then we went, went with this analytical hierarchy process method called AHP, where pairwise comparisons were made with those four solutions. Each interview took about 90 to 120 minutes with all the key stakeholders put into it. And then these are these four different solutions on these 100 green solutions that you see in a value path plot or known as uh, uh, parallel coordinate plots. Each vertical axis is an objective and you can see the variation. And based on this HP, the solution number three turned out to be the winner, which is this solution slightly different from the others. But because in these cases also, the decision makers were involved. So it's not, uh, it's not that they were not involved and this was just forced on to them. Uh, because they could not come up with a common solution here, this AHP finally picks one. So starting with an astronomically large search space, deducing to about 100, 200 solutions by an emo, and then doing manual visualization and decision making with the stakeholders to reduce it down to even few, like four or five, and then choosing one by AHP, I think is a very good way to solve this large scale problem, implementing both evolutionary as well as classical MCDM concepts. So that concept can stay in solving other problems as well. So with this, I come to the end. Hope I am able to convince you that many problem solving problems in practice require search and optimization routinely. There are some point-based classical methods. If they are applicable, probably they are designed for those problems, so you should Never use anything else. You should always use those methods, but understanding how they work will also give us more ideas about how to probably create some hybrid methods using both evolutionary and classical. But evolutionary methods are very efficient in getting a near optimal solution. They are flexible and they can be changed easily. They can be put with parallel computing and they have this implicit parallelism that really makes them work. Customization is still the key, but customization is more suited with the evolutionary methods rather than a very rigid point-based methods with gradients and all that. Optimization can also be used for knowledge discovery, as I said. So I think overall evolutionary computation methods have a niche in solving particularly multi-criteria optimization and decision-making problems. So if you have further question or comments, you can write to me at this email and I can point you to some of the applications in which you're interested in. Thank you for your attention.